Hello, I am Alexander Bugo, Vice President for Human Metabolome Technologies of America, located here in Boston, Massachusetts. Welcome to our first of several webinars on the applications of metabolomic profiling and research and development. If you have any questions today, please submit them in the question box. We will have plenty of time to address questions at the end of today's presentation. After my brief introduction, Dr. Laura Shelton will talk today on isotopic labeling for metabolomic analysis. The study of metabolites has been and continues to be a staple for clinical and in vivo decision making by increasing our understanding of biology and medicine. At HMT, we provide innovative metabolic platforms to areas such as cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and stem cell research. We were founded over 13 years ago on the premise that capillary electrophoresis, or CEMS, provides a unique and sensitive insight into metabolomic analysis, opening up new opportunities for discovery. Today's webinar by Dr. Laura Shelton focuses on using our HMT CEMS platform, F-Scope, to explore metabolomic flow using isotopic labeling. Metabolomic flow is a critical step in the understanding of the changes in metabolism during disease, aging, or therapeutic intervention. To set the stage for Laura, let's take a quick look at drivers behind metabolomic analysis and how our unique technology allows us to lead in this field. To understand how our technology has been developed to support metabolomic analysis, let us take a look at the complexity of the problem from cells to data to pathways. The complex nature of any disease often originates from impairment of several steps in different biochemical pathways, including genetics, transcription, and protein synthesis. In systemic disorders like diabetes, cancer, aging, and heart disease, the whole network of metabolism is drastically altered as a result in many upstream pathway changes. This metabolic change or flux is composed of many different types of metabolites, from hydrophilic phobic lipids to hydrophilic organic acids and nucleotides. It is important to recognize that most metabolomic experiments measure a concentration or relative concentration at a fixed point, what we call steady state metabolomics. However, metabolites like proteins are dynamic. Their structure and concentration can change with time, age, disease, and therapeutic treatment. Thus, a phenotype for cells, animal models, and humans can be defined by types and concentration of metabolites changing over the course of time. To capture this changing metabolome, no one analytic platform or universal platform exists. Like LC, GC, and NMR methods capture and measure many metabolites well, there are other metabolites that are not measured well or not observed due to sensitivity or resolution issues. I will show you today how CEMS opens the door for new discovery by measuring many metabolites that other techniques do not do well or see at all. For today's talk, Laura will examine how using CEMS-based F-Scope platform measures critical metabolomic changes at the cellular and tissue level, and how metabolite flow can be affected by upstream changes in gene expression in cancer, diabetes, and other diseases, or by therapeutic intervention. An example of phenotypic change based on change in metabolite concentrations and movement is observed in cancer cells. Aerobic respiration and proliferating normal cells uses primarily glucose for biomass production and the major source of carbon for the TCA cycle. Cancer cells, however, that display anaerobic respiration shunt glucose to lactate and require glutamine metabolism to be used to drive the TCA cycle independently of glucose. Glutamine metabolism then contributes to lipid synthesis via reductive carboxylation of alpha-ketoglutarate. While Warburg focused on glucose metabolism, we now know that cancer cells utilize a variety of nutrient sources provided by autophagy and lipogenesis. At HMT, we recognize the significance of these pathways and these metabolites, and using CMS, we have optimized to measure and quantitate them all in one analysis. What Laura will discuss for you today is C13 label of glucose and glutamine, and to follow the isotopic label in our F-source platform for a better understanding how these nutrients are utilized in cancer cells and how we may be able to prevent cancer cell proliferation and induce apoptosis through new target discovery. At HMT, we recognize that measuring and quantitating central energy metabolism is critical to understanding cell survival, but most importantly, critical to fighting cancer as a treatable disease, and that measuring these metabolites in normal, cancel, and treated cells is fundamental to cancer research and a foundation of our platform.
Today, the pharmaceutical industry and academia are designing drug candidates that target specific enzymes along these very pathways of glutamine metabolism, lipid biosynthesis, TCA cycle, amino acid metabolism, and mitochondrial respiration. To cite a few examples, glucose transporters are targeted for renal cell carcinoma. Creatinine kinases for colon rectal carcinoma, isocitrate dehydrogenase enzymes and glycoma, and 3-phosphoglycerate for breast cancer. Gardatine palmitoyl transferase in prostate cancer, and Argino succinate synthesized has been linked to hepatocellular carcinoma. Understanding the movement of these metabolites altered by drug treatment using F-scope in disease models allows for precise interpretation, discovery, and validation of these cancers' target pathways. For metabolic, systemic metabolite remodeling as occurs in chronic diseases, metabolite flow can be crucial for quantitative interpretation, biomarker discovery, or target validation. To assess the direction of flow through different pathways occurring simultaneously, a quantitative system biology approach is needed that HMT can provide for you. I do want to distinguish between determining metabolite flow using steady-state quantitation using C-scope, dynamic isotope labeling using F-scope, and metabolomic flux. Metabolomic flux is defined as changes in metabolic concentration per unit time. In these experiments, isotopic labeling is performed using multiple time points and multiple concentration ranges to develop complex algorithms to calculate and predict metabolic rates in a perturbed system. For most metabolic studies, however, this level of analysis is not required. What HMT provides in our FSCOP platform is isotopic labeling for many metabolites following the introduction of a C13 label substrate. Isotopic ratios of each metabolite are then measured in F-scope to determine the fate of the C13 or label carbons or isotopomers. By examining changes in isotopic distributions over time through variations in gene mutations or drug intervention, people like Laura can tell you something about pathways in cell survival or metabolomic flow. So what is needed in an analytical platform to determine isotopomer distributions? And what makes HMT uniquely specialized for success in metabolomics? The first requirement to measure isotopomers and follow C13 transfer is high-performance mass spectrometry. At HMT, we use modern mass spectrometry instrumentation with the resolution and sensitivity to measure isotopic patterns. While naturally occurring glucose occurs about 6.9% C13, the 6-6-carbon C13 glucose isotopomer uses, used to measure changes in glycolic and cellular rewiring is 100% C13. The high-performance mass spectrometers coupled to capillary separation to resolve and quantify metabolites, we can easily measure isotope ratios in F-scope for many downstream metabolites using many different labels metabolites as substrates, not just glucose and glutamine. In addition to having mass spectrometry resolution needed to track C13 transfer and metabolic movement, identification of the right metabolites is a necessity. This is where CE provides HMT with accurate and quantitative measurements for many metabolites that are difficult or impossible to identify using typical LC or GC methods. Capillary electrophoresis allows for the measurement and resolution of many polar, charged, hydrophilic metabolites that are unresolved or poorly measured using reverse phase or PFPP chromatography. In this diagram, the vertical lines represent linear dynamic range for the metabolites to the right. The dots represent RSD or variability of measuring these metabolites. The metabolites listed to the right are highly charged, phosphorylated nucleotides important in cancer research, mitochondrial dysfunction, energy metabolism, and chronic diseases. CEMS is the only platform capable of resolving and measuring all of these at a single analysis. In this example, none of the phosphorylated metabolites are observed using C18. Only a few are observed by PFPP, but the response is nonlinear. Only CEMS is able to resolve, identify, and quantitate all these important metabolites in a single analysis and be part of the EFSCO package. As I previously, previously stated, there is no universal metabolite detection platform. Each has their advantages. When it comes to polar hydrophilic metabolites, many of which are pictured here, CEMS is the superior method. The metabolites listed to the right are highly charged, phosphorylated central energy intermediates important in central energy metabolism, mitochondrial dysfunction, glycolysis, and neoglucogenesis. CEMS is the only platform capable of resolving and measuring all of these in a single analysis. In this example, most of these phosphorylated metabolites are not observed nor resolved using C18. 
while several are observed by PFPP, many are not resolved or nonlinear as you can see for the number of gray vertical lines. These unresolved metabolites are in red at the right. Only CEMS is able to resolve, identify, and quantitate all of these metabolites important in cancer and mitochondrial research or chronic diseases. These metabolites represent major pathways in NEFSCOPE. The importance of CE to separate and resolve and quantitate many critical metabolites in amino acid metabolism, energy metabolism, cannot be overstated. Many amino acids and organic acids are best resolved with CEMS for detection and quantitation. Important for the TCA cycle, cis and trans iconotate, isocitrate and citrate can be resolved and quantitated. For isotopical analysis using F-scope, these become critical metabolites to observe, along with isoleucine and leucine. With its high resolving power, high mass transfer, and our large metabolite library, HMT can monitor many critical metabolites using cation and anion detection, distinguishing it itself from various phase LC methods. This ability of CEMS to separate and measure all these metabolites in central energy metabolism sets us apart from other metabolomic platforms. Laura will show you how F-Scope takes advantage of the power of CEMS. I have described to you metabolic flux, deriving complex equations to quantify metabolic rates and isotopic analysis using labeled substrates with F-Scope. In comparison, our targeted panel called C-Scope quantitatively measures 116 metabolites along the central energy pathway, including glycolysis, pentose phosphate pathway, purine metabolism, choline metabolism, lipid metabolism, nicotinamides, TCA cycle, urea cycle, polyamides, glutathione metabolism, BCAA metabolism, and the methionine cycle. We refer to this as steady state metabolomics. HMT recognizes the critical nature of these pathways in designing our platforms. C-Scope is capable of detecting and measuring over 90% of the metabolites in these energy pathways using the superior selectivity and resolution offered by capillary electrophoresis. F-Scope measures a subset of these for isotope analysis. Often Laura will have our clients start with C-Scope to observe changes in cellular metabolism, then move to F-Scope to quantitate and discover the precise movement of nutrients. With unequal chromatography separation using capillary electrophoresis and state-of-the-art mass spectrometry, F-scope can measure isotopomeric distribution in over 50 metabolites involved in central energy metabolism, including the TCA cycle, pentose phosphate pathway, and amino acids, providing clinical data, critical data for evaluating disease progression and therapeutic intervention. In addition to our targeted quantitative solutions, C-scope and F-scope, at HMT, we also have on-target profiling capabilities using CMS, like basic scan and advanced scan for true metabolic discovery. If lipids are of interest, we have the ability to add LC analysis to augmented metabolites measured by CEMS with our dual scan option. With this option, we separate your sample, optimizing for polar lip metabolites in CEMS with one portion, optimizing for lipid metabolites in LC with another. Altogether, HMT is the right solution to match your metabolic needs. I hope with this introduction you better understand how HMT has positioned our technologies for success using the best of what CEMS can help deliver to provide unique metabolic solutions. Today, Dr. Laura Shelton will provide details and examples on how HMT accomplishes the task of measuring metabolic flow using our EFSCO platform. Laura is a scientific project coordinator at our Boston office. She has managed over 75 projects from start to finish. With her academic and biotech background in cancer metabolism, Laura is a perfect go-to person to discuss and collaborate with regards to central energy metabolism and isotope measurements. Welcome, Laura. Tell us about Escope and what solutions you can provide to our clients. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction of HMT's technology and services. Today, I would like to present a few examples of how to use isotope analyses and why they complement steady state metabolomics so well. We'll see a few examples of how C13 analyses can both supplement existing transcriptomics and genomic data, as well as examples of how C13 can uncover novel metabolic adaptations and potential therapeutic targets. Metabolomics, at its core, consists of glucose oxidation to pyruvate. 
which can then be converted to lactate or enter the TCA as acetyl-CoA. In the process, we have generation of reducing equivalents in the form of NADH, which contributes to ATP production. However, we've recently come to appreciate all of the various metabolic processes that take place in various cells, including cancer cells. We now know that glutamine plays a very important role in anaporosis of the TCA, as well as a precursor for amino acid and glutathione synthesis. Glucose has been shown to play a role in de novo serine and glycine synthesis and is now a known target for anti-cancer therapies. Glucose carbons will also play an important role in ATP synthesis. Pyruvate can also enter the TCA via pyruvate carboxylase, directly converting to oxaloacetate instead of acetyl-CoA. And oxaloacetate can be directly converted to PEP in cells other than hepatocytes. Though we learn that much of the TCA cycled in a purely clockwise fashion, we have come to learn that reductive carboxylation is very common in a variety of cell types, particularly in conditions of hypoxia for the sake of citrate synth synthesis. And more recently, we discovered the reverse reaction of SDH, or complex II, will allow for ATP synthesis, also in conditions of hypoxia, with fumarate acting as an electron acceptor in place of oxygen, resulting in an accumulation of succinate. Most metabolomic studies begin with untargeted or targeted profiling, considered to be at steady state levels, meaning the levels of the particular metabolites at that time of capture. Steady state metabolomics are extremely useful for determining overall pathway inhibitions or elevations, or for dete detecting biomarkers. Endpoint metabolites are particularly useful as surrogate markers of pathway activity. For example, elevations in lactate usually indicate that glycolysis is upregulated. However, few endpoint metabolites exist, and typically most metabolites are involved in multiple pathways. Glutamate, for example, is at the crossroads of glutathione synthesis, amino acid and polyamine synthesis, as well as TCA cycle anaporosis. If we see an increase in steady state glutamate levels, does that mean more glutamate is needed and is therefore in higher levels in the cells? Or does it mean that glutamate is not required at such a high level and therefore is building up due to a decrease in usage or enzyme activity? Therefore, the big question becomes, how can we determine the directionality of metabolite usage? Isotope analyses have become a crucial next step for researchers with steady state metabolomics data. These analyses rely on the use of heavy atom labeled substrates, such as C13 glucose. With the sensitivity of the capillary electrophoresis separation, we can accurately resolve the various isotopomers of the labeled metabolites. While NMR is highly specific and can go as far as give the exact position of the label, traditionally it requires a lot of sample and is not as sensitive for low-level metabolites. Our high-resolution CE separation allows for the sensitive detection of even low levels of isotopin refractions, as well as the less often detected low-concentration metabolites and their various isotopomers. In a very basic schematic illustrated here, a C13-labeled substrate, typically glucose or glutamine, is added to a cell culture for a short time point, usually four to eight hours. This usually ensures that the metabolite fractions of interest are not completely saturated with label, thus allowing us to better analyze the various isotopomer contributions and potential changes in metabolic pathways. After the incubation period, the metabolites are extracted using the same protocol used for steady state metabolomics. Samples are then separated and run and the resulting peaks annotated for isotopomer distribution. The data can then be graphed, typically as a stacked bar shown here, showing the percent of each isotopomer relative to the total metabolite pool. And in the example here, we can see that about 80% of lactate is labeled on three carbons as a result of an incubation of the cells with C13 glucose, as illustrated by the red bar. This is a quick excerpt of, of a data set that we generated using E. coli cultured in C13 glucose for a series of time points, ranging from 0 to 240 minutes. The color scale is representative of the total number of carbons that are labeled. You can see how over time the label gets incorporated into a higher percentage of the total metabolite pool, for example, glucose 6-phosphate, and by 240 minutes, the entire pool of G6P is C13 labeled, represented by the red portion of the bar graph.
we can continue to trace the label through the pentose phosphate pathway out to ATP synthesis, where we initially see five carbons labeled as the main fraction, as contributed by PRPP, and eventually it increases up to 10 labeled carbons due to contributions from glycine and formate. We also trace the carbons into the TCA cycle, where again we see the initial main pool of labeled citrate is only on two carbons from acetyl-CoA. But over time, more label will be added and citrate will eventually be labeled on all six carbons. In this example, the data provides a wealth of information. You might think that it's sufficient to just provide ATP and citrate, but we'll see in later examples how the intermediates can play a significant role in determining the fate of carbons. I'd like to start by illustrating some of the ways that our collaborators have used F-Scope for publications in support of other data like transcriptomics. Recently, constitutive stabilization of NRF2 has been reported in many human cancers due to genetic or epigenetic reasons, such as somatic mutations or reduced expression of the KEEP1 inactivator protein. In all cases, the degradation of NRF2 is impaired and instead the protein is stabilized. Because NRF2 induces many cytoprotective genes, NRF2 positive cancers are expected to be resistant to chemo and radiotherapy. Aside from chemo and radio resistance, NRF2 strongly promotes cell proliferation, as a significant decrease in cell proliferation was observed after siRNA-mediated knockdown of NRF2. The authors also examined target genes of NRF2. As a result, they found genes involved in the pentose phosphate pathway and NADPH production were all directly associated with the NRF2 transcription factor. Because NRF2 directly activates a number of metabolic genes, the authors examined whether NRF2 alters the metabolite flow along the corresponding pathways. Here, the cells were pulsed with C13 glucose or glutamine after NRF2 knockdown. When C13 glucose was used, you can see the clear increase of glycolytic intermediates and decrease of inosine monophosphate, the precursor of de novo purine synthesis. When C13 glutamine was used, you can see the reduction of lactate and glutathione accompanied by the increase of glutamine. This suggests that NRF2 promotes both glutathione synthesis and glutaminolysis leading to lactate production as well as de novo purine synthesis. A more detailed analysis interestingly revealed that when NRF2 is deleted, while IMP and PRPP were re reduced, resulting in a decrease in nucleotide synthesis, the other pentose phosphate pathway metabolites were all increased, suggesting a stagnation of the PPP. We can also see that there is increased flux towards serine and glycine as a result of the elevated glycolytic and pentose phosphate pathway intermediates. To confirm the metabolic studies, NRF2 was overexpressed and again subjected to the labeling experiment. We can see that after only an hour, C13 flux to lower glycolytic and pentose phosphate pathway intermediates were reduced, with a corresponding increase in IMP and other purines. We can also see that now flux to serine and glycine synthesis is also reduced. In summary, NRF2 redirects glucose and glutamine into the anabolic pathways of purine and glutathione synthesis. So while oncogenic pathways involving P53, HIF, and mTOR facilitates glycolysis, and CMIC promotes the uptake of glutamine and the conversion of glutamine to glutamate, we see that NRF2 helps fill in the gaps to push metabolites into the pentose phosphate pathway and towards glutathione synthesis. Next, I would like to introduce an example of a novel metabolic adaptation discovered using C13 in our model of the mitochondrial complex 1 disorder MALOS. MALOS is characterized by a mutation in complex 1, thus resulting in an inhibition of the electron transport chain and a heavy reliance on glycolysis. Patients with MALOS accumulate lactate in their plasma. To reduce acidosis, clinicians use DCA. DCA inhibits pyruvate kinase, which then leaves PDH more active, allowing pyruvate to be converted to acetyl-CoA, thus reducing lactate production. While this treatment does reduce lactate production, most patients still struggle with other symptoms. Pyruvate treatment, on the other hand, improves multiple symptoms, but the mechanism has not yet been elucidated. Using a PCA analysis and steady-state metabolomics, you can see that when the MALA cells were treated with pyruvate, their metabolic profile shifted closer to that of the wild-type cells, 
However, in the DCA-treated cells, their metabolic profile was still very similar to their disease counterpart and also very different from the wild-type cells. A 13 labeled pyruvate. The authors showed that the added pyruvate was not converted directly into citrate in the MALOS cells on the right of the graph, compared to wild type on the left. But instead, the label was detected in alanine, along with an increase in unlabeled 2-oxoglutarate levels, suggesting that the alanine transaminase was activated with pyruvate treatment. 2-oxoglutarate can then go on to stimulate the TCA, thus possibly alleviating many of the symptoms associated with May loss that simply removing lactate cannot. In the previous examples, we were simply analyzing the most abundant isotopomer compared to the unlabeled fraction. For example, fully labeled lactate compared to unlabeled lactate. But what about the other isotopomers? Can we learn anything from those? And the answer is yes, and these other isotopomers can sometimes provide much more detailed and interesting information than the most abundant or expected ones. Reductive carboxylation is still a fairly new concept, initially recognized in cancer cells during times of mitochondrial dysfunction or hypoxic environments. This phenomenon has also been recognized in muscle cells during a similar assault on mitochondrial complexes. Reductive carboxylation is characterized by the reverse TCA, starting with IDH running in reverse, converting 2-oxoglutarate to citrate, presumably to generate citrate for lipid synthesis and other anaporotic reactions. As illustrated here, reductive carboxylation can be modeled fairly easily using uniformly labeled C13 glutamine. If IDH were to run in the normal direction, all of the malate carbons will be labeled. Once acetyl-CoA condenses with oxaloacetate, the resulting citrate will be labeled on four carbons as well. However, if IDH runs in reverse, there is no removal of the terminal carboxy group and citrate will retain all five labeled carbons from glutamine. It's important to remember that citrate in the cytosol will be acted on by ATP citrate lyase, generating a separate pool of malate. If we have four carbon labeled citrate, the pool of malate will also be 4-carbon labeled. However, if we have 5-carbon labeled citrate, the resulting pool of malate will have 3 labeled carbons, as the N2 are removed to make acetyl-CoA. Therefore, looking at both malate and citrate can help to identify changes in TCA cycle directionality. In the data presented here, we see that in a treated sample, the percentage of 4-carbon labeled malate increased, suggesting that TCA is cycling in the traditional direction. Looking at the data for citrate, we also see that the percentage of 5-carbon labeled citrate decreased in the treated samples, again suggesting that the TCA is cycling more in the traditional direction compared to the control. Some of my favorite data sets are those that utilize less common substrates or labeling patterns. In this example, we were given samples labeled with one carbon malate. Admittedly, this was not the original intent of the experiment, but it yielded some interesting patterns nonetheless. What we noticed was that while the majority of malate was labeled on just the single carbon as expected, we were detecting a small but reproducible fraction of two carbon labeled malate, as illustrated by the yellow bar. Additionally, we noticed two carbon labeled glutathione, illustrated by the neon blue bar. Although it took a while to really map out what could be happening, we realized that these cells were thought to have high PEP carboxykinase activity, thus creating a pool of labeled PEP and pyruvate. If that label were to make its way back into the TCA as acetyl-CoA, the resulting citrate will be labeled on two carbons, creating a pool of two carbon labeled 2-oxoglutarate, and in theory, glutamate as well. With glutamate being the precursor for glutathione synthesis, this could be the explanation of 2-carbon labeled glutathione. If 2-oxoglutarate continues around the TCA, we now end up with a small pool of 2-carbon labeled malate as well. I also wanted to illustrate an interesting cellular response to oxidative stress. In this example, we were labeling with glutamine. And you can see that while nearly the same amount of glutamate was labeled in the control and knockout, there was a significant drop in 3-carbon labeled glutamate, illustrated by the yellow bar in the knockout, compared to the control. And instead, we see an increase in the percent of 5-carbon labeled glutamate in the knockout, illustrated by the red bar, 
This pattern is mirrored in glutathione, illustrated by the green and yellow bars respectively. Now looking at the carbon transfer around the TCA, you'll notice that once glutamine enters the TCA as fully labeled 2-oxoglutarate, it will subsequently acquire two unlabeled carbons from acetyl-CoA and lose a labeled carbon as CO2, now generating a separate pool of three carbon labeled 2-oxoglutarate. Therefore, we can possibly conclude that it is this TCA cycle derived 2-oxoglutarate that is contributing to the three carbon labeled glutamate. Meaning, glutamate can be synthesized directly from glutamine as well as from TCA cycle derived 2-oxoglutarate. In the knockout, you'll notice that there is a significant increase in 5 carbon labeled glutamate, suggesting that the glutamate pool is made entirely of glutamine carbons and not from any TCA cycle derived 2 oxoglutarate. We think that the cell was reacting to increased oxidative stress and therefore was trying to push the synthesis of glutathione. And so less glutamate was entering the TCA and more was going directly to glutathione. So while the steady state amounts of glutamate were nearly the same, the usage of those carbons was altered. Sometimes I like to use the amino acids as really nice checks of the data and surrogate markers in the instances where maybe some of the other metabolites are not labeled. In this example with aspartate amino transferase, you can see that the nitrogen from glutamate is transferred over to oxaloacetate. The glutamate carbons then become the carbons on alpha-ketoglutarate and the oxaloacetate carbons become those on aspartate. I will say that although we cannot detect oxaloacetate, the labeling pattern on oxaloacetate should be the same as on malate. And so here, the data I am showing you is actually malate. And you can see that the labeling pattern on malate mirrors that perfectly to the labeling pattern on aspartate. In the case of alanine aminotransferase, the same is true, except that the pyruvate carbons become the alanine carbons. Though slow, there is a push to develop methods that allow for the in vivo monitoring of tumor metabolism. Recently, some papers have suggested that tumor cells can alter their preferred metabolic pathways depending on whether or not they are cultured in vitro or in vivo. Too often, we test drugs in vitro that then fail in vivo. In the paper here, human tumors were grown directly in the brain of a mouse, thereby bypassing the in vitro environment. What was interesting in this example was the active glutamine synthesis that was observed from glucose substrates. Typically, we think of tumors as glutamine sinks, possibly indicating that the tumor metabolism reflects some of the cell of origin. In this case, the tumors are likely of astroglial in origin, which actively synthesize glutamine for neuronal signaling. Studied in vitro, however, may have shown that these cells had a strong requirement for glutamine. The data illustrated here also indicated that while in vitro, often we see the majority of glucose being oxidized to lactate, a higher percentage of glucose was entering the TCA, possibly suggesting that the Warburg effect may be more pronounced in vitro. HMT has been working with our collaborator at Boston College in an attempt to optimize in vivo labeling. We too were using a glioma-based model. Tumors were grown subcutaneously in the flank, and then a single bolus of C13 glucose was injected. Tumors were then collected 30, 90, and 180 minutes after C13 injection. You can see early labeling of lactate that quickly clears after 90 minutes. There is a time course increase in citrate labeling, with the clearing again by 180 minutes. Glutathione, on the other hand, shows a much slower rate of synthesis and therefore a continued increase in label over the full 180 minutes. Interestingly, although grown in the flank, we too see glutamate and glutamine synthesis using glucose carbons. However, due to the large portion of aspartate that is unlabeled, we can assume that glutamine is still a major requirement for these cells. Aside from the articles presented today, I've included a few additional papers that may be of interest, all of which have used our C13 isotope analysis to support their publications. This list will be available in the webinar slides for download. So in summary, we can see that steady state metabolomics or even seahorse measurements cannot always give information on the flow and directionality of metabolites. Therefore, Isotope analyses are often employed to track the direction of carbons and give insight into enzymatic rates.
isotope analyses can also reveal novel, novel metabolic pathway and adaptations to cellular stress and disease. And finally, isotope analyses can reveal novel therapeutic targets. Thank you for your time today. I hope we have provided some interesting data and illustrated the utility of isotope studies. We are now ready to answer your questions. Hello everyone, as we submit your questions, please go ahead and take a look at your control panel. There should be a questions box and go ahead and submit your questions there so that Laura can answer them. First question, what is the cost per sample for F-scope? That's a very common question and unfortunately there's no one simple answer. Um, cost will depend on the platform chosen, the number of samples, the kind of analysis, and so um, basically custom quotes are, are made for each individ individual experiment. Thank you. Um, can you detect 13C1 pyruvate converting to 13C1 lactate? Um, in theory, yes. It will um, completely depend on the amount that is present, um, how much lactate is being produced, uh, um, how high of a concentration that pyruvate exists. Um, so if you're starting with, say, 3,4 um, C13 glucose, you expect to have only a single label in pyruvate, but that level will be at uh, a pretty low level. So we, we should still be able to detect it, but it will be at maybe about 12% in lactate. Whereas if you're adding um, exogenously labeled pyruvate, um, we would expect to see a much higher conversion to lactate at that point. So again, the, the answer is uh, yes, um, but it will depend on the individual experimental conditions. Thank you. Now for metabolic tracing, do you need to use media without the non-labeled substrate? Is that correct? Yes. Yes, that is correct. You um, traditionally want to remove all of the um, cold substrate, so you would purchase media without any glucose, and then when you are ready, um, you add in your C13 glucose as the only glucose source. The next question, does CEMS separate citrate and isotrate? Yes, it does. What is your detection limit of 13C1 lactate? Um, that that will depend, I guess, on, on how much there is. Um, we can detect very low concentrations of isotope and refractions. We can detect the natural abundance of labeled lactate, which is at 3.3%. Um, so as long as the percentage of um, exogenous label is higher than that, then we can separate it from the natural, the amount of natural abundance. So, you know, five percent. If we were to detect, de detect five percent of one carbon labeled lactate, we can accurately assume that about two percent is from the exogenous label. Perfect. Uh, for the next question, what is your experience with media without splicing? Are the cells okay with that, and for how long? Um, we have experience with cells grown without serine, um, so uh, if the media doesn't have glycine, actually we don't necessarily see an issue with that because most glycine um, will be synthesized from serine. Um, obviously it will depend on your specific cells and what their specific requirements are, but in general the cells will switch over to active serine and glycine synthesis if it's not present in the media.
So the next question, for the time of incubation, you mentioned that it's between two and four hours. What do you think happens when they are labeled for six to 24 hours? So that will depend on what targets you're specifically interested in. Um, most C13 glucose studies are labeled for a shorter time point because the early glycolytic intermediates in lactate will um, take in that label very quickly and become saturated very quickly. Um, for TCA cycle labeling from glucose, you generally want to wait at least six hours um, so that the label can make its way into citrate and the later metabolites. Um, depending on the rate of cell proliferation, um, 24 hours you can start to see label in um, secondary and tertiary metabolites. So say the urea cycle and polyamines. Um, so it really depends on what kind of experiment you're performing. If you want to basically see um, overall where your label is going, then a longer incubation time is probably better. If you are looking to see specific changes in um, enzyme activity or um, activation or inactivation of particular enzymes, then a shorter time course is probably better. So the next question, how many time points are recommended to study mass isop uh, isop isopomer distribution? You really only need a single time point to be able to see the distribution of the various isotopomers. Um, obviously, if you're looking at uh, traditional flux studies where you're looking to determine enzymatic rates, um, then probably at least three time courses are required. Um, though I will say the majority of our studies utilize only a single time point um, as they're more focused on overall um, pathway indications and, and where that label might be going. Great, now for the next question, how, how, much time points are, uh, how many time points are required to calculate the metabolic fluxes in the C13 enrich, enrichment exp uh, experiment? For example, uh, the, P, the PDH, ACLY reaction? Yeah, I think I actually just answered that. Uh, we think probably a minimum of three. And three with the label, including a, a zero hour time point, is probably best for analyzing um, a flux time course. You know, that seems to be the last of the questions that were submitted. We'll give it a few more seconds to see if we get any more questions. Is there a good way to test the direct or bidirect, uh, bidirection reaction? Um, probably a time course analysis, I would say. Um, again, if we can detect all of the various um, reactants and products, um, we can then, you know, see where those carbons are going and which direction is probably preferred. Um, so for, you know, glutamate, um, you can imagine that we can see if the label is going to glutathione versus aspartate um, versus 2 oxoglutarate. The next question, what metabolites can you not detect? You mentioned oxalocetate as one of them? Um, I guess it depends on the metabolite that you're interested in. We would have to look at our um, annotation list and see what is included and what is not. Oxaloacetate is specifically not detected because it's um, a little too unstable to um, detect over time. But traditionally, we can detect um, all of your glycolytic intermediates, the pentose phosphate pathway, the rest of the TCA cycle, amino acids, glutathiones, um, polyamines, the majority of those central energy metabolites will be detected. What do you mean by zero times point? Does one prep the same as a zero time point? Basically, it, it's the samples um, without C13 glucose. So um, at the time of adding C13 glucose to your other samples, you have a separate sample for collection and you 
collect at that time point before any um, C13 is added. Can you detect the NAD pool? Um, yes, we do have NAD, NAD plus, NAD PH, and NAD P plus. And um, we, for detecting metabolite pool versus um, uh, mitochondrial versus cytosol, that would require um, the mitochondria to be isolated separately. Um, and, and yes, we can detect the various metabolites in those fractions, but they would have to be separated prior to metabolite extraction. And I think that may be it for questions. We'll give it a few more seconds here. Next question, how about ATP, ADP levels? Yep, we can detect ATP, ADP, AMP. Um, we can also add in GTP, GDP, GMP. Um, basically, all the purines and pyrimidines we can detect. How much 13C metabolite is usually administered in animal models? Um, so it depends on if you're doing um, a, a continuous infusion um, versus single bolus. As a single bolus, it's usually in a high concentration, um, which I do not know off the top of my head, but again, it will depend on the method that you're administering that C13. Do you have a protocol for washing mitochondria off systolic met uh, metabolites? Um, that would have to be a specific protocol for the isolation of mitochondria from the cells first, um, and then a separate extraction for the two fractions. Any experience with muscular dystrophy uh, mouse samples or human samples? Um, we have experience, yes, with human samples, um, as well as mouse samples. I would have to see if we specifically have worked with a muscular dystrophy model. In many cases, we're not given all of the information, but we have worked with mouse samples. So um, muscle, plasma, serum, urine, any other tissues we have experience with. Do you have specific protocols to prevent ATP from hydrolyzing uh, during the sample pre uh, preparations? So we recommend um, a very um, immediate extraction with methanol, which tends to um, keep the ATP in its native forms. Um, what is nice about our quantitative data is that we can quantitate ATP, ADP, and AMP, which allows us to analyze the um, kind of the, the health of the cells, but also the um, preparation as well. If that ratio is very low, then it's a good indication that either the cells are not healthy or that um, there was maybe too much time during the extraction protocol. Next question. Do you incubate the media without the labeled substrate before the pulse? And I mean to uh, deplete them from the cold substrate? Some people will and, and some people do not. Sometimes they will do um, a short, say, glucose starvation um, for maybe an hour or two hours prior to adding in the C13 glucose. Um, other times they will purely just switch out the media from one with um, cold glucose to one with the C13 glucose. Sometimes the starvation itself will induce metabolic changes that um, may not be beneficial to the study. Um, so again, it, it will depend on your specific study design. What is the minimum number of cells recommended 
about 2 million for cancer cells. If we're looking at um, T cells or, or other primary cell types, then we um, typically require upwards of 5 to 10 million. Next question is, what type of mass spec coupled to CE? I mean, vendor, is it from thermal or water or fire? Um, well, it is time of flight, but we use Agilent. Great, that seems to be all of the questions. Uh, thank you guys and thank you everyone for the wonderful questions. If you still have questions after today's webinar, please feel free to contact Laura via the email on the screen. Thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Thank you.